Today on Timescast. Millions of dollars spent on campaigns by hidden sources revealed in today's times. Going into the weekend, four teams fight for a spot in the World Series. An artist sketches subway passengers on his iPhone. So, Jim, the president and Democrats generally have been talking a lot in recent weeks about anonymous money coming into the campaigns, largely to help Republicans, and, and a lot of it coming through the Chamber of Commerce. And today, we actually unmask some of those uh, big political donors. Through some amazing reporting by Mike McIntyre, Don Van Natta, and Eric Lipton, we were able to show and really tell who's behind this. So the, the veil has been lifted a little bit. So who are some of those really big donors? We've got Prudential getting involved, we've got Dow Chemical getting involved, large corporations with huge issues pending down on the hill. And what issues do we think they're specifically interested in? Well, we, we can't say because they won't still won't say. Right. But what we can say is, well, Dow Chemical gave nearly $2 million when some legislation was pending that would have tightened security requirements at their factories. They were against that. Um, Prudential gave $2 million last year when the chamber is running ads against a financial reform package that the Democrats are pushing. So, I, you know, you can Draw connect dots conclusion. or not. You know. <laughs> right. Um, a lot of people think of the Chamber of Commerce as sort of their local, you know, small business organization. But in fact, what this piece shows is that most of their money really does come from a very small number of donors. Yeah, I guess we can say that there's mom and pop, and then there's papa and mama. <laughs> right. and, so we, and the papas and mamas are counting for a higher percentage of their dollars. So what the story today shows is that, you know, a handful of these companies account for a giant percentage. So Jim, if the chamber doesn't have to release the names of its donors and the companies don't want to release their donations, how did we go about finding this stuff? Um, corporations have foundations, and foundations that give have to list who they give to. So while the chamber, as a foundation, does not have to say who it's received money from, foundations that give to them do have to say who they give money to. So it's but searching through their records. It's searching through other records. But it's company by company. Company by, it's needle and haystack stuff. When the season started, the smart money expected the Phillies and the Yankees to meet again in the World Series. Both teams kind of struggled through the seasons, both made it to the playoffs, but then both fell behind in the league championship series. Now both have won game five. So they're both down three to two. Where do you see things going from here? Well, I wouldn't be at all surprised if the Yankees and Phillies do pull this out. They are tough teams, resourceful teams. They play very well in the late innings. They did meet in the World Series last year, and they could easily be meeting in the World Series in game one next Wednesday. Probably the one obstacle to this rematch, of course, is Cliff Lee, who would pitch game seven for Texas on Saturday night if the Yankees win tonight. He has been the best pitcher in the postseason. He is the one mountain that the Yankees will have to move. Now, both the Yankees and the Phillies have these big payrolls. The Giants and the Rangers are kind of smaller payrolls. Is there any possibility that the idea of winning a World Series share would be motivation for those clubs more than the Phillies and Yankees? I'd say 40 or 50 years ago, when before free agency, when uh, a World Series share might be $25,000 and it might be half of a player's salary and many players worked in the offseason selling cars, selling stocks on Wall Street. A World Series share might have been a real motivating factor. In this day, it's hard to see that. M most of the players make millions of dollars. In the fabric of an entire team, it's hard to see how a World Series share could really be a difference. This weekend's Metropolitan section focuses on New York's famed subway. It features a report card on Jay Walder's first year running the MTA, historic subway photographs, cut-out etiquette cards, and a report by Emily Hager about a stealthy sketch artist. It is almost like hunting in a weird way. It's like the thrill of the hunt, but it's a hunt for a great looking face or a really interesting looking person. Eric Malinsky is a freelance radio reporter, but he has a hobby. He likes drawing people on New York City subways using his iPhone. By using my finger, uh, there is sort of a crudeness that I'm forced to really respond to what I see. And I think the drawings in a weird way are much better than if I had been using a, a sketchbook. I don't let people know that I'm doing this. If they glance and look at me like, is that guy drawing me? And I'll kind of look away, nope, not at all. And then, you know, if uh, they then just continue reading, that's fine. But if they're really looking at me, and I, if they're annoyed, then forget it, I'm done. Malinsky is not the only artist working on the iPhone's canvas. Jorge Colombo uses it to draw cityscapes for The New Yorker. Malinsky uses an app called Sketchbook. 
Each of his initial drawings take about 30 seconds. First, he does a quick black and white sketch. I try to capture what I see, because what's out there is always so much more interesting than what I would have come up with in my head. And then he lays down layers of color. On the subway, sometimes you don't really have that much time, because people are always coming in and out. Or I need to go. Often, Malinsky has to finish the details at home. So something like this, you know, I may want to add another layer, then I go back, and, you know, maybe I want to clean that up. Ah, there we go. That's better. Um, he posts his drawings to a blog and now has nearly 300 drawings on the site, including one of me. For The New York Times, this is Emily Hager. Join us again on Monday for Timescast.